Yes. I'm back. I know you got something else. I know you got to have something good. You got a few minutes? I got a minute or two. I <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to spend just a few minutes talking about why science is hard. Okay, so you spend your whole life trying to get people to get into science. This morning you wake up and you go, you know what? Forget all that. Let's let's just tell them the truth. <laughs> let's tell them science is hard and, and drive them where they belong. Well, I don't I don't think you're going to surprise anybody with science is hard. You know? But hard in a way that maybe you hadn't fully appreciated. Okay, now, now, okay, once again, you've okay. intrigued, you've okay. intrigued me, right. now, you've course, intrigued in, me. In the physical sciences, especially physics, astrophysics, this sort of thing, you need a tandem background in math, and many people don't like math. So True. for them, science might be hard simply because it has math, right? So, but I'm going to, I'm going to go someplace completely different. Ooh. Okay. Oh, okay. Now I'm, now I'm really I'm going to tell you why, why it's hard. Because yeah. guess what? The thing you just said was enough for me. Okay. <laughs> you had me at math. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here's why. Okay. And this is going to be storytelling. Okay? Excellent. I love <clears throat> it. Storytelling. Go for All it. right. So back in the 1700s, late 1700s, there was an astronomer named William Herschel. Uh, he was wealthy. You know, had access to great telescopes, and he liked looking up. All right. Herschel. Herschel. All right. Um, he um, discovered an object that moved against the background stars. Okay. okay. Cool. And people had discovered such objects before. They were all comets. Okay. All right. It's, if something's moving, and it, it's a comet. So he kept studying it, and he... And if you read his research papers, it was odd comet that this is. It's not showing any fuzz. That's a peculiar comet. I wonder when it will start showing fuzz. And he goes on and on and on about this account of an unusual comet. Hmm. He discovered the planet Uranus. Oh, wow. And you, and you know why he was in denial? Because no one had discovered a planet before. Right, right. It was an act without precedent. All right, all the known planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, they, these are the planets in the sky of the Earth, all of them were known since the ancients, and they're bright enough, cavemen would have seen it. So no one had to, that was, they were not from the act, any act of discovery, because they're all brighter than the naked eye limit in the nighttime sky. So Uranus was the first planet to be discovered, and it required a telescope. And he was in denial of it. Because it had no precedent. So first, the scientist is challenged by discovering something for which there is no precedent. Hmm. What do you call it? How do you think about it? What do you? He didn't say, oh, I discovered a new planet. He said, I discovered a weird comet. Right. So he discovers it. He realizes it's a new planet. This was big news, international news. <clears throat> and what do you do? Oh, he's a Brit. Uh, by the way, this is late 1700s. So there's King George. This is the same King George of... Declaration of Independence, to whom right. it was written. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes. And so uh, he named it after the king. Oh. So for, and I have textbooks from this period of time, after that planet was named, but before it got renamed, <laughs> for a while there, the enumeration of planets was Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and George. Ah! Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. Come on, <laughs> say it. He, listen, you want to keep the king happy. The man, mm -hmm. you know, you can't blame. Don't blame. Right. And listen, you can't piss off the king. I saw <laughs> Hamilton. I saw Hamilton. <laughs> I saw Hamilton. I know you don't want to mess with King George. All right, right. That's happening. It's the same king, right? Exactly. Okay. So that lasted a, a few decades until clearer heads prevailed. It's in a wait a minute. It's a planet. And how are the previous ones named? Well, they have Roman name, Roman gods. So right. Uranus is kind of both Greek and Roman. So there it is. So it got named. Damn, okay. right. that is unfortunate. Okay, <laughs> you wanted a, you wanted a planet George. I swear to God, it would be so great. We are <laughs> launching a probe to planet George. <laughs> <laughs> or it would be funny, or a, a probe to Freddy, you know, just yeah, some name. 
No, because maybe that would have started a precedent where you just start naming stuff like, you know what I mean? Well, and, look, and, uh, comets get named after people like you were. Like Haley, Haley's Comet. Yeah. Haley's Comet, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now here we go. I'm not done yet. All go right. ahead. So you track the orbit of Uranus and you find out it's not following Newton's laws of gravity. Whoa. And Newton's laws have been known for a hundred years by then. Right. Okay. And so people said, hmm, maybe we found the outer limits of where Newton's gravity applies. Uh, because it worked between Earth and the moon, Earth and the sun, the moons of Jupiter, everything that was orbiting somebody else that we observed, that Newton's laws were bang on. But let's go farther out in the solar system. Here we are at the farthest most planet, Uranus, and it's deviating from where Newton's law is predicted. Wow. So you say, all right, do we need a new law of gravity? No, Newton's, Newton's been working pretty well lately. A new one to extend Newton's laws because it doesn't apply that far out. Maybe it only works in our own solar system. You don't know this in advance, okay? People have to figure this out. So they say, all right, um, maybe Newton's laws do apply at Uranus, but there's another planet out there that we haven't discovered yet that's tugging on it. Mm. And we didn't put that in the equation. So, so maybe Uranus, Newton's laws are correct, and Uranus is being touched by yet another planet Ooh. that's out there. So here we have a situation where, all right, if there's another planet, how are we going to figure out where it is? Right. This is an extremely difficult math problem. It's one thing to have an object, invoke Newton's law of gravity, and say, here's the strength of gravity at this distance from you. Okay. okay. It's different to say, here I am responding to a force of gravity out there, and I don't know how strong it is, and I don't know where it is. So exactly. it's, an, it's a mathematical inversion problem of, that gravi of the gravitational setup. And so two brilliant mathematicians took their, took, took their genius to this. And one of them is, is Urbain Le Verrier, French, right? <laughs> and another guy named uh, John Couch Adams, okay? And I think he was a Brit. And so brilliant mathematicians, they did this inversion problem, and Le Verrier got there first. And he said, hmm, if Newton's laws apply and there's something tugging on it, it should be a, an object over here in this part of the sky. Okay. And so he, he, he got the message to the Berlin Observatory, and there's a guy named Johann Gall, who the night he, the day he received that note, that night he looked where he was supposed to and found the planet Neptune. Holy crap. It was a, just... a triumph of Newton's laws of gravity, a triumph of mathematics, a triumph of international communication and cooperation. And there it was. Planet that, Neptune. That's amazing. Totally amazing. And it's a beautiful story, too. It's beautiful.